write or hear from God. What do you hear when you bring up, will humanity make it? After thousands of years, they're still killing each other. I actually said that to God. God said, Neil, here's the formula. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wondered what's going on in the world, and if there's a God, what in the world she or he has to do with anything, then do we have the Conversations with God show for you. Today, I'll be talking with Neil Donald Walsh, the runaway New York Times number one best-selling author of the Conversations with God series about one of the most profound and important books I have perhaps ever read, The God Solution, and his latest God Talk. And I'll put that in quotes, God, because perhaps it's our understanding of God that may actually be creating the mess here on earth. And that's just what I want to talk with him about today, about our perceptions and misperceptions or misconceptions of God and the universe and how it appears to have driven us to the brink. So welcome back to the show, Neil. Are you ready to shine? No, I'm not ready. I I don't want to even do this. Oh, my God. How did I get roped into this? There's one question, just one question I'm going to ask that illustrates what I truly love about you, Neil. And that question is this, drum roll, please. What is the two word name or definition you would give us for God that we can all learn from? Pure love. I believe that God is pure love. And you know what's sad, Michael, to be serious for a moment, most people who believe in God, and that's by the way, eight out of 10 people. Surveys have been taken by sociologists in all the nations of the world. And they went around, they went around, this is in the past eight or 10 years, they, they just took this worldwide survey and they asked people one question. It wasn't an extensive survey. They just said, could, could we ask you one question? Most people said, sure, what's the question? The question was, do you believe in a higher power? And 8.5 statistically, out of every 10 people, said yes. That is, 85% of the people said, yes, we believe in a higher power. But what's sad about that is that of the 85% of people who say they believe in a higher power, we can't reach even 50%, even 30% of those people who agree on what that higher power is, what it wants, if anything, what it does, if anything, when it doesn't get what it wants, to say nothing of how we, or even if we, could use such a higher power. So that's why I produced a document called The God Solution, because I I believe that the human race is facing a major, major problem, a global problem, based on our understanding or if you please, what I believe to be our misunderstanding of who and what God is, who and what we are, what is the purpose of life in any event, and how, if we can at all, could we best use the power that has been vested in us by the highest power in the universe. So that's why I wrote a book called The God's Solution. Thank you, Neil. Based on that, would you say the world is in crisis right now? Absolutely. And if anyone doesn't think that the world is in crisis, they haven't looked at just just the climate changes that have occurred and that are producing outcomes on the planet that are difficult for most people to believe, much less accept responsibility for. The challenge of our climate crisis is that the world's people are either saying it doesn't exist or that if it does exist, we had nothing to do with it. It's not our fault. And what we don't accept responsibility for, we can't change. So that's that's absolutely a crisis. To say nothing of the financial crisis people are yeah. facing and the political crisis people are facing. Michael, I don't want to give you a 25-minute answer to a 30-second question. But I have to tell you that I I believe that we are facing a crisis of interaction. I have never seen the level of alienation between people 
of different races, different cultures, different political persuasions, different uh, religious ideas. I've never seen the kind of alienation on this planet that I'm seeing right now. Right now, we're living in a world where people say or believe, if you're different from me, if you hold different political beliefs, if you belong to a different nationality, if you hold different religious beliefs, if you have a different philosophy, if you have a different sexual orientation, whatever your difference is, that makes me better than you. You have become the enemy. You have become, if not the enemy, perhaps it's too strong of a word, you've become the problem. You're the problem. And I've never seen, honestly, in all the years I've been on the planet, I've been around for a while now, eight decades. Uh, and if, you, if you've been with me during those decades, you know that times have been much different 40 or 50 years ago than they are right now. So I've never seen this kind of alienation. And it's based on, this is what's sad about it, Michael, our alienation is based on the way we think that God behaves with us. That is, most people who believe in a higher power at all believe that God is loving for sure, but also judgmental, condemning, and punishing. And because we believe in a judgmental, condemning, and punishing God, we've allowed ourselves to be judgmental, condemning, and punishing with each other. I have a T-shirt in the other room. I had it for one of my interviews. It seems to be appropriate here. Uh, nice, organic, cotton, comfortable. It's got a big bear on the cover. And what's the bear doing? Reaching out in a bear hug. It seems to me that the answer to life's problems may be as simple as that person you don't agree with, that person who's different than you, that person has a different sexual orientation, political orientation, uh, gravitil <laughs> orientation. If we went to pure love, that would take care of everything. Overnight. So the question is, what stops us? Uh oh. Well, as long as everyone understands that you are the problem, yeah. you and, and the other 8.2 billion people on the earth, that is, frankly, all of us are the problem. We simply have to change our beliefs because our beliefs create our perspectives. And our perspectives create our perceptions. And our perceptions create, in fact, what we believe in the next day, the day after that, the day after that. That is, our perceptions recreate our beliefs on a daily basis. And our new beliefs create our new behaviors. And our behaviors create our realities. And our realities create our experience. So we see then a direct line from our perspectives to our experiences and to our realities. If we want to change the reality of life on earth, we have to change our beliefs, our most fundamental beliefs about God, about life, and about who we are. Thank you. I want to dive into all of that. Years ago, I think it was 2011, you wrote a book, The Storm Before the Calm, and I wonder how present you were, how much you could see this coming, or how much this has actually gone even further than you expected it would. Well, it has done exactly that. You've talked about all of this being part of our evolution, and that other civilizations uh, uh, around the universe have gone through many of these challenges. But have we gone off the rails a bit here? Because what you're saying is very strong, that it's our beliefs that are setting ourselves up. And it sounds like our beliefs are going even farther from the direction maybe we desire to go in. Unless this is the polarization, the game of opposites, there's no way to see the light or to see that you are light until you see darkness. This is actually in some way helping us. Yes, but, but if it goes to the extreme, uh, that which we had hoped would help us can actually damage us. And in fact, at the, at the outer limit, it can actually destroy us. And if we think that we're the first civilization on this planet to move towards self-destruction, we need to think again. An entire civilization existed on this planet before this one. That is, we're not the first humans to have been inhabiting the Earth, in my view. Can you tell me more about that? It's called, by sociologists, called the matriarchy. There was a period of the so-called matriarchy where we, we, we had an entire civilization. 
a, a very highly developed civilization run, operated by females, the matriarchy, ladies, sweet ladies, wonderful ladies, but they were in charge of everything. But they allowed the beliefs to of, of the entire civilization, both men and women, to take them to the brink of their own self-destruction. Now we're doing it again. Now men are doing it, basically, because not, not men exclusively, but, but more men than women, because men have now taken over the positions of power in our religions, in our political organizations, in our economic approach to life. Uh, men have taken positions of power, and they've not learned from the mistakes that were made in the matriarchy. So here we are at the same brink, where if we don't change something in the next 20 to 30 years, I'm not sure that our civilization is going to survive. Powerful words, forgive me for asking, when you write or hear from God, what do you hear when you bring up this discussion? Will humanity make it? Yes, I hear that humanity will make it. But um, in, if we're not careful, see, God never makes predictions. And that's what's important for people to understand. My books are not predictive, uh, but they are instructive. And there's a difference between prediction and instruction. The instruction I receive from God is that if we do not change our ways and alter the direction in which we are moving, we could get to the place where the smallest number of us survive. The human race will never be rendered extinct. I'm told that the human race will survive. But we could wind up going back to, if you please, the caveman era, where there's just a few of us hanging on to and holding on to the highest thought about who we are, and then having to rebuild the whole system again from the ground up. Will it be possible? Yes. Could it happen? Yes. Will humanity be rendered utterly and totally extinct? No. But do we want to move to a place where there's only a handful of us left and we're starting over a third time to rebuild humanity in the way that the highest thought about who we are and who God is could support and could sponsor? Let that be our question for the day. Or do we still have enough time left for us to change direction and stop our inexorable movement into the worst possible outcomes? Thank you. I want to go to your story for a little bit. You hit many years ago. Uh, three big things happened to you, the trifecta, we could call it. Um, you got three times lucky. Um, not a fun gift from the universe, but it puts you at rock bottom, Neil. And I'm wondering, metaphorically and literally, what that meant and how you didn't give up. And if there are parallels we can draw between your rock bottom and where humanity seems to be driving the ship, I'll use that word, on autopilot today. Well, um, I'm sure what you're referring to is what occurred in my life just prior to my conversations with God experience. To, to bring people who may not be aware of that up to date, uh, what Michael is referring to is the fact that I did have the, the trifecta of uh, experience in my life of all the worst things that could happen to you. I had the worst things that could happen to me in my life all happened within the same 10-day period. Number one, I lost my relationship with my significant other. Now, I'm happy to say that it wasn't a bitter parting. The relationship did not end in massive negativity. We simply agreed with each other that it wasn't working for us to remain together. And so we agreed on a frankly, kind and loving separation. 
and to end our marriage. But it was not a happy moment for me. And so, because I lost my day-to-day -day interaction, not just with the lady that I married, but with the children that we created. And it was a very sad moment for me, very sad moment. It went to the next level because five days later, as luck would have it, I lost my job. And not because I was not performing well. In fact, just the opposite. My boss told me that of all the people he hated to lose, I was the one he hated to lose the most, but he had no choice because I had no seniority. I was the last person in. So when the corporation decided to downsize for many fiscal reasons, I was the first that they had to lay off. They called it a layoff, but in fact, I was fired ultimately. I was never rehired. So I lost my relationship and lost my job in the same five-day period. But wait, the world wasn't done with me yet. Because three days after that, I'm driving down the road, going heading for a, 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 an appointment to be interviewed for a new job. And I thought, you know, I'm going to get this job because I have all the qualifications. I'm perfect for this job. But it's an elderly gentleman, as I'm driving down the road to this appointment, turned left in front of me, crossed the path of my vehicle. He misjudged the distance between our two cars, smashed into my car. It wasn't a fender bender. My car was totaled. And I was nearly totaled because he hit the passenger side. I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, he hit the driver's side of my car. That is, he smashed right into me. I mean, physically, I wound up with a broken neck. And of course, I was taken to the hospital. And when I got uh, there, they put me under to relieve the pain and tried to do what they could constructively with my mangled body. But when I woke up, a doctor looked at me and said, you need to know that you suffered a broken neck in that accident. And it wasn't what you'd call a hairline fracture. I recall the wording on the x-ray report I'll never forget it because I memorized it. I, I suffered a three-quarter inch avulsion fracture of the seven cervical vertebrae posteriorly. In other words, a break in my neck large enough to put a pencil through. The doctor said to me, Mr. Walsh, I must tell you that Eight out of ten people who suffer a fracture that major in their neck do not come in here alive. They're generally killed on the spot. But you manage to survive that fracture. Even more astonishingly, those who do survive such a fracture inevitably suffer paralysis from the neck down. You have escaped both outcomes. And the doctor looked at me and said, what do you intend to do with the rest of your life? Because you've been given Mr. Walsh a once in a lifetime gift. So I had to think of what I could do. They put me in a Philadelphia collar, which is a therapeutic device that you're instructed to wear. And he said, you're not to take this collar off for any reason. It's a plastic collar that holds your head up. He said, imagine a basketball being held on the head of a pin. That's what's going on right now in your body. So you will not take this collar off for any reason. Not to sleep, not to shower, not to make love, 
The collar comes off for no reason until we tell you that your neck is now solid enough. It's fused, and you can now hold your own head up. So no, no one would hire me. Michael, I couldn't get a job anywhere. because, And finally, after about 14 interviews, some kind gentleman looked at me and he said, Neil, I got to tell you the truth. No one's going to hire you while you're wearing that device on your neck. We're all very clear that you have a disability, and 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 it's obviously severe. One wrong move if we hire you, and we're paying for your medical bills for the rest of your life. So we can't hire you until you come in here without that device on your neck. I ran out of money after about three or four months. I ran out of my savings. The men who owned the apartment I was working in, uh, that I was living in, said to me, "You know, we've got to ask you to leave." So I couldn't pay the rent. It gave me a couple of months to try to get my act together. I couldn't find a job anywhere. I had no income. I was out of money, and he asked me to leave the apartment. That is, I was evicted. Now I'm living on the sidewalk. I have no place to go. I'm living on the street with my hand out going from person to person. Could you give me anything? A, a dollar, a, a half dollar, a quarter. I'll take whatever pocket change you've got. It was the most difficult time of my life. Can't imagine what it's like to sleep on the concrete. You sleep in the rain. You can't get out of the rain. You can't get out of the cold. You can't even find a place to relieve yourself with dignity. No place to go to the bathroom. Michael, I was trying to sneak into restaurants sneak into fast food places so I could slip into the bathroom before the manager would ask me to leave. Because I looked terrible. I was obviously a street person. I smelled terrible. And they would say to me, please, please, please don't, don't panhandle in here. Please don't come in here and ask people for a donation. Just leave quietly, and we won't report you to the police. That went on in my life for a year, Michael. I wasn't on the street for a bad week or for a tough couple of months. I was out there, as they put it. I was out there for a year of my life, two weeks shy of one year. So I finally was able, because I found a little... Part-time job. Finally, How'd you able. find it? I was in broadcasting. And I went to a radio station that I heard was looking for weekend announcer. Somebody to take somebody to take a weekend gig to fill in for the full-time guy because he didn't want to work seven days a week. So, and I had broadcasting experience. So I actually got a weekend job at a small radio station in the city where I lived. And I was able to do the, the weekend gig enough and I could, I was able to save enough money. And I finally found a little apartment, a one room garage apartment on top of somebody's garage. But at least I was out of the weather, out of the rain, and I had my own toilet, and I could go to the supermarket and get a few pieces of food. I ate frugally, but at least I ate. I didn't have to walk down the street and ask people for contributions to stay alive. That's when I woke up at 4.30 in the morning, one night, calling out to God, okay, okay, okay. What does it take to make life work? What is it I don't understand here? And what are the rules? 
I remember actually writing an angry letter to God on a yellow legal pad. Dear God, what don't I understand here? Tell me the rules. I'll play. I'll play the game. Just tell me the rules. I thought I was a halfway decent person. You know, I'm not going to say I never told a fib or never lied or never misled anybody, but I never committed any major crime against humanity. What have I done to deserve this life? And what do I need to know for the struggle to be over? Other than ending my life, there must be some solution short of suicide. So what is it that I don't understand? The understanding of which would change everything. And that's when I began hearing what I believe to be the voice of the divine in my mind. As I'm writing on the yellow legal pad, I heard in my head, okay, do you really want answers to all of these questions? Or are you just venting? And I can recall writing it down, you know, I am venting, but I sure as hell like to know the answers if you've got them. And the voice in my mind said, you are sure as hell about a lot of things. But wouldn't you rather be sure as heaven? And so I wrote an answer, what's that supposed to mean? And I started an on-paper dialogue, question-answer, question-answer, question-answer. I never dreamt in a million years that anyone would ever see this. I'm having a very sacred experience. It became yeah. very meaningful to me. It went on for many weeks. Every night at 4.30 in the morning, I'd wake up. 4.23 to be exact. I even, I even asked, you know, what's magic about 4.23 in the morning? So I'm always having these conversations with God. And God said, take a look at your birth certificate. Of course, I didn't have, you know, I didn't, it wasn't like I was carrying it around in my pocket. But I had to write to the county where I was born. And I had to pay him, like, I think it was $16 to get a copy of my birth certificate. But I did, I did do that. I got a copy of my birth certificate. Of course, you know the answer. It says that I was born at 4.23 in the morning. So I was having these awakenings at the moment that I was born, 4.23 in the morning. And I kept on writing these answers that I was receiving to life's biggest questions. And then I was told in the dialogue that I was having, this on-paper dialogue, I was told, you will make of this one day a book, and it will be accessed by many people. And I thought, <laughs> now I got gotcha. you. Now I got gotcha. you. Because, of course, I'm, I'm thinking this is all part of my imagination. So if God is really talking to me directly, prove it. Nobody's going to publish a book by a guy who claims to be talking directly to God. Come on. I mean, I could just see the publisher walking out to the workroom floor saying to his editors, hold the presses, stop everything. I got a guy here who's talking to God. It's not going to happen. But in fact, I sent it to a small publishing house on the east coast of the United States. And by golly, if they didn't, they put a book out, a book of my dialogue my handwritten conversation. And they didn't change a word of it, no editing whatsoever. They put it out exactly as it appeared on the yellow legal pad. And I thought, okay, 
I can't believe it. They're actually going to publish this book. Nobody's going to buy a book by a guy who claims to be talking to God. It didn't sell 500 copies. It sold 5 million. Not bragging, just saying. <laughs> so when God tells you something, you probably want to believe it. If Neil tells me something, I'm going to listen. <laughs> well, not if Neil tells you something, but if God tells you something. And you know what, Michael? The book wound up being translated into 37 languages. I mean, it's sold in 37 native languages around the world. Who even imagines such a thing? Backing up from there, and we're going to dive into God and the meaning of God and how, forgive me, screwed up our belief is in God. And I hope set some things straight, I hope, today. How? Because I, I'm, I'm taking this also metaphorically as humanity hitting the rocks, humanity going down, humanity having the trifecta right now. How did you keep going? And how did you keep going without getting bitter or feeling more separate to others? Or like today, we're clanging heads. You are the problem. Because it would have been easy to go into that store and somebody or, or fast food place and the manager is gently ushering you out and have lost it. Well, during that period of time before I had my, what I've now come to call my conversations with God, I did lose it. I, mean, I didn't get violent, but I lost my faith in life. I lost my faith in people, and I lost my faith in myself. Of course, I was you know, sleeping on the sidewalk, Michael, sleeping you know where I could stay stay away from being arrested for loitering, or you know. So I wound up trying to find a place to hide at night where I could sleep, get a couple of hours sleep. You know, deep in the woods somewhere or whatever. So I did lose it. I lost my faith in everything. And that's why I started writing that angry letter to God when I finally did have a little part-time job and got off the sidewalk. That's why I wrote that angry letter. Because, you know, it was just, a, it was, I didn't really expect, obviously, to get a reply. But I just wrote, dear God, what does it take to make life work? And it was just an angry outburst on paper to me it was more than an angry outburst it was something we could all benefit from it was a lifeline it turned out ultimately to be that because people who read my story in you know, in the first book what became the first book related to it and i was asking i was asking questions that everybody asks you know what does it take to make life work and what have i done to deserve a life of such continuing struggle. And in fact, what are the rules? Somebody give me the rules. I'll play the damn game. Just tell me the rules. What have we done? Nothing. God said, you have done nothing in the way that you're asking the question. It's not that life is not a punishment. Life is not, you know, a get back at you. For, because God thinks that you've not obeyed the rules. So, Neil, you've done nothing wrong. Have you made some mistakes in your life? Mistakes in the sense that if you hadn't done those things, you know, life would have turned out better in some instances? Of course. Of course you made some wrong moves, said some things in your life that maybe you wish later you had never said and so forth. But you've done nothing wrong. So life has not turned out for you the way it's turned out as a punishment. And then what was the second question? I know the third is, what are the rules? What is it I don't understand about life, about myself? God said, sweetheart, what you don't understand is who you really are. You think that you're a life form, not all that different from a bird in the sky or a fish in the sea. It's just a form of physical life. You may, you may have convinced yourself that you're a little more sophisticated, perhaps, than a bird in the sky or a fish in the sea, yeah. but you're still basically a, a physical life form. 
And that's who you think you are. You're born, you live, you die. That's the beginning and the end of it. And maybe even you, maybe you even hold some beliefs about what happens after you die. But you're not acting on the best of those beliefs. And most of you don't even hold the best of those understandings. That is, the beliefs that you do hold about life after death are in the largest number of you complete misunderstandings. So you don't know who you really are. So I said, okay, I'm, this is a back and forth dialogue, of course. So I'm writing back to God. Okay, great. So who am I? Give it to me straight. Stop playing around with words. Just tell me. God said, okay. I'll tell you who you are. You are an individuation of me. What? I wrote. What are you, what are you telling me? I'm an individual expression of you, of God? And the answer I got was yes. That's when I said, okay, then tell me the rules. How do I play this game? What is it I don't understand? If I'm supposed to be an individuation of divinity, why is my life a mess? God said, for the same reason that the life, the collective experience of humanity is a mess and has been a mess at some level from the beginning of time. You do realize, of course, God said to me, Neil, you do realize, of course, that there has been armed conflict on your planet for 92% of recorded history. From the beginning, you've been fighting each other. When you're using sticks and stones as your weapons, you were fighting each other. Then you found a way to sharpen the sticks and make them into arrows. Then you found a way to make better weapons than stones. You call them bombs. But you're still throwing them at each other. After all these years, after thousands and thousands of years, you're still killing each other when you disagree with each other. You haven't found a way to step out of the Stone Age responses to people with whom you disagree. You, you actually kill them. I said, well, you're, you're kind of exaggerating a little bit, God. God said, am I? You're having an argument right now about where the borderline between two countries should be, and you're killing each other by the thousands over a border dispute. And then you're telling me that I'm exaggerating? Wake up to who you really are into what you're doing. Thank you. Is it, Neil, is it possible it's our belief of God or who or what we see God to be that's creating this mess? Yes, I think so in large measure because we believe that God is judgmental, condemning and punishing, as I mentioned earlier. And so we allow ourselves to imagine that it's okay for us to be judgmental, condemning, and punishing with each other. But it's not simply our belief in the God of our understanding. It's also what we believe about ourselves. That we believe, among other things, the most important thing that we believe about ourselves is that we're separate from everybody else. I mean, I'm over here, 
and you're over there. So that allows me to do things to you that I would never allow anybody else to do to me. And it allows me to get away with it because I think that we're separate from each other. If I thought that we were connected in some really important, viable, meaningful way, I could never treat you the way I treat you. That is, people couldn't treat each other the way they treat each other because we would realize that what we're doing to the other, we're doing to ourselves because we are all one. So the biggest error that primitive civilizations make is to embrace the notion that we are separate. First, separate from each other. Second, separate from everything else. And we're not even one at any level with the environment. Mm -hmm with the animals, with things that grow. No. We've convinced ourselves that because we're separate from all of it, that we should have dominion over the earth. And then lastly, we've decided that we're separate from God. God is up there presumably for those of us who believe in a God, that God is up there and we're down here. And never the twain shall meet, except on Judgment Day, when we will be judged and sent either to heaven or to hell. This is what the majority of the world's religions believe. It seems like a completely different way of of understanding that is with each decision, with each action, with each breath, it is our own judgment day. We are the creator and we are creating with each one of our decisions or judgments. I believe that that is what is true, Michael. But my sad observation is that by far, not by a little bit, but by far the largest number of people do not hold their experience in that way. They don't see themselves as being responsible for what's going on in their own life, and they certainly don't see themselves as being responsible for what's going on in our collective experience. So if we throw a hat on you, we call you uh, Dr. Walsh. Uh, Dr. Walsh, what is belief mod <laughs> and how do we how do we how do we triage this get get everybody in the emergency room because it sounds like we need to shift now the method by which we can shift our beliefs is to arbitrarily shift our state of being it turns out michael that we are human beings and most of us think that we are human doings. That is, most of us think that we're trying to be happy, or trying to be secure, or trying to be, you know, safe in life. And that how we get to be these things is by what we're doing. If I do this or do that or do this or do that, then I can be these things that I wish to be. This is called the paradigm in which we live. But what God said to me was, Neil, you've got it all backwards. Yeah, you seek that to give you an example. God said to me, let me give you an example. You seek that life works this way. If I have good grades, I can do the thing called get a diploma, and I can be the thing called employable, desirable to other companies. When I have enough money, I can do the thing called buy a house, and I can be secure in my own dwelling. When I have enough charm and have enough 
understanding of how to deal with other people, then I can do the thing called have relationships. And I can be the thing called happy in my life. It's called the have, do, be paradigm. Mm -hmm. God said, the sad part about it, Neil, is that you have it backward. It doesn't work that way. It works this way. You start where you hope to end up. Start by being secure. Then you will do things that a secure person does. And then you will have all the things that a secure person has. Start by being loving. And then you will do all the things that a loving person does, and you will wind up having all the things that a loving person has. This is called the be, do, have paradigm. Change the way you've been living your life. You've been living it in reverse order. Start with being what you wish to be. And of course, I said to God, you know, that sounds all very lovely on paper, God. How can I be what I'm not? How can I be happy if I'm not happy? How can I be loving if I'm not feeling loving? How can I be secure when I don't have the experience of being secure? To which God said, ah, wonderful question. You have to ask yourself, what would cause you to experience security? What would cause you to experience love? What would cause you to experience all that you want to experience? You must decide to be it ahead of time. So, Here's what God said. Neil, here's the formula. Before you walk into any moment, decide to be happy, secure, and loving. If you decide that you are love, I am love, I am secure, I am happy, then you will say and think and do things that a person who is happy, secure, and loving would say, think, and do. But I said to God, how can I don't understand? You lost me around the last quarter. How can I how can I say and do and think those things if I don't feel that I am actually being them? God said, Neil. Beingness is an arbitrary choice. It's not something that you be after something happens. It's something that you be because you're choosing to be it. Beingness is an arbitrary choice. Life is not a process of discovery. It's a process of creation. So then, Neil, what is the choice humanity gets to make now? We get to decide who we wish to be. We get to decide who we choose to be. We get to decide who we are as a civilization, as a species. There's only one question that each of us is inviting to ask. We are invited by life itself to ask ourselves a single question. Every moment of our life, who am I? And who do I choose to be? I mean, who am I right now? And who do I choose to be? in response to everything that I'm seeing and, and experiencing all around me. Who do I choose to be? Mm -hmm. Who am I? 
am I really this am I really this physical life form more sophisticated perhaps but not in any huge major way different mm-hmm. from other life forms from the bird in the sky or the fish in the sea who am I God said the challenge that you're facing Neil is you don't know who you are and even when I tell you who you are you reject it you disbelieve it you literally disbelieve it that is you make your belief in it go away why is that because you can't believe it for an astonishing reason it's too good to be true mm-hmm. I actually said that to God. I said, God, you're telling me that I'm an individuation of you. But that's too good to be true. What you're saying to me is too good to be true. And God replied, oh, sweetheart, if God is too good to be true, if God can't be too good to be true, then who can? So you have to believe in what feels and sounds like it's too good to be true. That you are the source of love, the source of security, the source of happiness in your life and in the lives of all those whose life you touch. Thank you. It's interesting. It's uh, on a bear, keeps on going in and out of a sliding glass door uh, just just behind our, our recording studio here. And... Uh, her song since birth was, you're just too good to be true. <laughs> you're too good to be true. Can't take my eyes off of you. How do we go to that special sacred place when, forgive me, there is barf, there is poop, there is everything, not just on the streets, but on the internet, on the airwaves, on everything, it's... I, 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 need, I need to tell you a story that's very vivid. And, and, and because you mentioned poop, I have to tell you a story. Okay. When I had my open-heart surgery, I was in recovery. They told me that my surgery was you know, a success. But mm-hmm. they, didn't, they didn't want me to, to walk around or to do any exercise for at least you know a week, 10 days, just to give my heart muscle a chance to adjust to the open heart surgery and the outcome. You know that 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 Hana had heart surgery twice after birth. She, she's doing great. She's doing amazing. We just got uh, the uh, all clear for the next four to six months and maybe uh, we'll keep an eye on her, but all clear for life. The too good to be true goes right down that vein. Yeah. Well, I was born also with a congenital heart defect. I was born with a congenital heart defect that took its toll on me little by little through the years until I eventually needed to have that open heart surgery that I'm describing to you. But here's the point I wanted to make. I had a male nurse because he, he would take me into the bathroom and help me to eliminate yeah so he would take me into the bathroom because i said i i, you know, I, I didn't want to use a an adult diaper he said well you don't have to you don't we could, we could put a diaper on you but you don't have to do that you can you can certainly make this small journey from your bed to the, to the bathroom but he said i'm going to go in there with you i said really you, you need to be here with me he said yes I want to be with you throughout the procedure to make sure that everything is okay. And so I, there I am sitting on the toilet. I don't do, hey, I'm sorry to be graphic, but I'm sitting on the toilet and the nurse says to me, no pressure. Don't strain. Don't push. Don't, 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 don't try to push. Just let it happen without any strain of any kind. And of course, I'm embarrassed. I'm pooping in front of this guy. And I said, gosh, this is, I said, this is so embarrassing. This, 
I've never had to have this experience. I've never had to poop in front of somebody as an adult. And this nurse looked at me and he said, Neil, nothing that is human lacks dignity. Only the way in which you hold it and do it. This guy is talking to me like a minister. He's a, he's a nurse. He gave me my dignity in the bathroom. And when I came out of there, and they put me back in bed. I looked at this guy and I said, I'm telling on you. <laughs> I'm telling on you. And I picked up the phone next to my bed. I dialed the operator. I said, I need to talk to the supervisor of nursing. And not on the phone. I want a personal conversation. Tell that person I promise he'll only take five minutes, but I must have five minutes with this supervisor of nursing. And she came in about an hour and a half later. How can I help you, Mr. Walsh? I said, I need to tell you. What a blessing. Gregory, my personal nurse is. You need to understand that Gregory is an extraordinary human being. She looked at me and she smiled and she said, we already know. So, what about the poop? What about all the things in life that are not so pretty and that are even, in fact, ugly? God says that the process by which civilizations evolve is when all is said and done and evolution has occurred, understood to have been part of the blessing of your physical life. What's important for you to know is that you do not have to continue behaviors that you decide are unbecoming of you. That is literally, not figuratively, but literally unbecoming. That is, you are not becoming, you are undoing what you were hoping to become. So they are unbecoming. So, Neil, God said to me, the problem is not that certain parts of life are ugly and not so welcome. The problem in life is that you're doing nothing about it. You're allowing yourself to hold the experiences as ugly rather than change them in such a way that you can see them as the gifts that they are. And you know what, my friend? I now even, even see the gift of going to the bathroom. I see it as a gift. Thank you, God. But I have stopped seeing the behaviors that no longer serve me as gifts. I see them as stopping me from becoming who I choose to be. I see them as unbecoming. And I decide to eliminate them from my behaviors and in whatever way I can to work toward eliminating them from the behaviors of other people. Thank you. And as someone who's been there with a bedpan more times than I care to admit, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. What does, Neil, what does in, in, this, in this time of the evolution or potential devolution 
of humanity, what does taking action or stepping forward mean to you? It means that I am expressing my true self. It means that I have been given an opportunity by life itself to demonstrate, thus to experience through the expression thereof who I really am. So it means that my life has become meaningful in that no longer are very many of my emotions, my words, and my thoughts wasted. I'm not wasting another minute of my life. It was along those lines. Thank you, Neil. I'm going back to Gregory. What's the golden rule mean to you? You know, I've now learned about the platinum rule, the golden rule, do unto others as you would have it done unto you. But I've learned about the platinum rule. Do unto others as they would have it done unto them. And I try to live my life by the platinum rule, because platinum is even more valuable than gold. So I seek to do unto others as they would have it done unto them. Let's, let's dive down that rabbit hole briefly. One, one of the concepts you talk about is the overhaul of humanity. And it seems incredibly important now. And the platinum rule, we individually have a hard time doing a dance. Maybe it's because of the tribe. Maybe it's because we're working to do the dance with our ego. I'm not picking on the ego. It's a, it's a good partner on this journey. Challenging partner. Good partner. But we don't seem to treat ourselves very well or feel we deserve to be treated very well. And maybe that's what we're seeing as the outer representation around us is, well, if I don't deserve to be treated very well, then this place doesn't deserve to be treated this well. How do we treat people even better and this earth even better than we feel it deserves to be treated? Well, I'm not part of the we we're talking about, nor have I been for 30 years. I treat, I treat myself very well. When I wanted to get a new car, I got a new car. When I wanted to eat a dessert, a splendid dessert, I ate a splendid dessert. When I wanted to have a sexual experience, I asked my wife if she's in that space and I see if I could talk her into it. But I'm, I'm really, and, and I'm, you know, my wife said something to me about 15 years ago. She kind of woke me up to how I am. She once looked at me and she said, you know what? You never do anything you don't want to do. How, 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 do you, how do you get away with that? You never do anything you don't want to do. I said, ah, oh, sweetheart, the trick is wanting to do what you're doing. I have chosen to do things that 25 or 30 years ago I wouldn't have chosen to do. I now want to do things that I probably wouldn't have wanted to do when I was 42. So I, my desires have changed. So when I'm being good to myself, it turns out that I'm also being good to everyone whose life I touch. Because I no longer want to be good to myself in a way that would deprive someone else of something that they choose or desire or wish to experience. So I have changed my way of being, and I live my life in a different bubble. The bubble I live in right now is I'm good to myself. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm ridiculously good to myself. I get up when I want to get up. I go to bed when I want to go to bed. I eat what I want to eat. I wear, wear what I want to wear. I say what I want to say. I, I, I think what I want to think. And I do what I want to do. 
and I don't do anything that I don't want to do. But I have broadened my list of things that I want to do to include things that 25 years ago I wouldn't have wanted to do. Because I now realize what I'm seeking to accomplish. And I didn't know what I was seeking to accomplish 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand. Oh, 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 I, I see. I'm here to express, to experience, to demonstrate, not to anybody else, but to myself, who I really am. That's what brings me the greatest satisfaction. So, of course, it changed the whole list of things that I chose to do. And it brings it right back full circle to acting out of pure love. Love for oneself. What have you learned, Neil, over the last year since we last spoke, let's say? Not a damn thing. But many blessed things. Mm -hmm. I've, not learned, <laughs> I've not learned a damn thing. I love you, Neil. <laughs> what are those blessed things? Or what are what is if you look back over the last year, you go, wow, I do this differently. I say this differently. I act differently. I understand this in a more blessed me manner. I haven't learned anything really. All kidding aside, but I have remembered more. Mm. Um, I have become aware through my memory of who I really am and what's really true about life, that life is not a process of learning. We've come here to learn nothing. Everything we need to know, we were given to know. All the wisdom, all the understanding, all the awareness was placed inside of us at the moment of our birth. So I've not really remembered, or I should say, I've not really learned anything, but I have remembered what I always knew. I've remembered, and what have I remembered in the past year that I had forgotten before? How easy it is to be love. How easy it is to be generous. How easy it is to be compassionate, and how easy it is to never forgive anyone for the rest of my life. So I never will. I have made a decision that I will never forgive anyone for the rest of my life for anything. Please tell me more, because clearly judgment or non-judgment has to do with this. When I give a talk in a church, and I'm frequently invited to do so, I will say to the congregation, thank you for inviting me to be here with you this morning. The important message I've come here to help you to explore is, God will never forgive you for anything. Get it out of your head. You think that God is going to forgive you for anything. And the place goes crazy. People actually, some people get up and leave the church because they think I'm talking heresy, blasphemy. But I say to them, God will never forgive you for anything because God cannot be hurt, damaged, frustrated, angered, or upset injured in any way, no matter what you think that you can do or say to cause those reactions in God. You can't upset or anchor God in any way, because God needs nothing from you to be totally happy. Not only that, but God understands how you could behave the way you're behaving, given the place that you're at in the evolution of your species and in the evolution of your individual soul. So God understands 
how it could come to pass that you would think, do, or say the things that you think, do, and say that you imagine would offend God. Just as you understand what a a 16-month-old child might think, do, or say. Because you're aware that the child is, my goodness, simply behaving the way a 16-month-old would behave. And you don't expect a 16-month-old to behave like a 160-year-old person. Therefore, Neil, remember this. Understanding replaces forgiveness in the mind of the master. If you forgive someone or think that you should forgive someone for something, then you have misunderstood who you are. You think that they have really hurt you or damaged you in some way. And I had to argue with God. I said, oh, God, come on, help me out. Of course I've been hurt and damaged in my life. God said, only because you have not held an awareness of who you really are. So what if somebody comes in and shoots me? What if if somebody kills me? That hasn't hurt me or damaged me in any way? God said, of course not. Of course, if you think you're this, if you think you are your body, or you think you are your mind, yes, in that case, under that illusion, you can imagine that you've been hurt or damaged or injured in some way. But when you understand that you are a spiritual entity, a demonstration of divinity that cannot be hurt, injured, or damaged, or angered, or frustrated in any way, then you will no longer have to forgive anyone for anything because you will understand that they don't know who you really are. Much less do they know who they really are. I was told the story of Pope John the Twenty Third, mm-hmm. who was in a motorcade in Rome a number of years ago, and a man stepped out of the crowd and shot him six times, and all six bullets hit the Pope, mm-hmm. and he survived. Amazingly, he survived, and when he recovered from his severe injuries. He went to the jail cell, the man who attempted to assassinate him. And when he got to the jail cell, he said something quite extraordinary to that man. He said, I bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. And the reporters who were standing outside the jail cell, because he doesn't go anywhere without the media following him, said, Holy Father, why would you bless the man who tried to kill you? And the Pope said, as I was invited to, is I remember the words of someone who said to all of us, bless Bless, bless your enemies and pray for those who would persecute you and do good to those who would do you evil. And when a man slaps you on the right cheek, turn and offer him your left. And when a man asks you for your coat, Offer him your shirt as well. When a man demands that you go one mile with him, go with him, Dwayne. And then the Pope turned to the prisoner and he said, Would you do me a favor? Could you please simply tell me no judgment, no anger from my side? I'm just curious. Could you help me understand why you did what you did? And the man said, of course, I'm glad to tell you. I believe that the Catholic Church has done more as an institution to damage or harm my people than any other institution on the planet. And I was furious about it, and I wanted to pay back. I was hoping I could at least kill the Pope and make a point. 
in the pop sense, or I can't agree with the solution that you came up with in your mind. I can't agree with your action. I hope that people would never repeat that action. But I can understand how you could have done such a thing. And you know what? The Pope and the prisoner became pen pals. They wrote letters back and forth to each other from the jail cell to the, to the, uh, to the Vatican for seven years. And then after seven years, the Pope asked the civil authorities in Rome to grant the man his freedom. The Pope said he's, he paid for his mistake, seven years of his life, grant him his freedom. And the civil authorities in Rome set the man free. So uh, I have come to understand that understanding replaces forgiveness in the mind of the master. So I, I will never forgive anyone for anything. I love it. Just a few more questions that I need to know where to send people and, and we'll, we'll, we'll wrap things up here. Bringing things full circle again. You're driving down the road. You get off the highway. You get to an intersection. There's somebody holding up a sign that say that says anything helps. What would you do? Stop the car. Take out as much money as I'm carrying on my body and give it to the man. And say, bless you, my brother. Be well on your way. What else would I do? What else would anybody do? Ruthfully? You know, on our better days, the day we got Hana out of the hospital, it was giving the jacket off of my back to a guy who was frozen, looked very cold. But for most of us, without judgment, we come up with a list of, well, they might do this, they might do that, they might do the other. We have been taught, trained, and then trained to go to that place of um, God is made in the image of man rather than man is made in the image of God. Therefore, if I am judgmental, God must be judgmental, and therefore I must judge. Even our judgments can be misjudgments. What God said to me was, allow each soul to walk its path. And that's what I've done. Might he take the money and buy drugs with it? Yeah, he might. You know, might he take the, the money and go into a liquor store and buy a bottle of four roses instead of eating? Yeah, he might. Allow each soul to to walk its path. Thank you. Four quick questions that just a word, just a one sentence answer, anything would be brilliant. What does we are all one mean to you? That there's no separation, but there is individuation. So there's no separation between, between me and anything else, not just any other person but no separation in reality between me and the tree in my backyard or between me and the dog in my lap or between me, in fact, and other people. And most important of all, no separation between me and the essential essence that I refer to as God. So what it means to me is that I'm not really separate from anything. And I treat things as if they were part of me. You know, and it, i got to tell you something. For some reason, I've always felt this way, even before my conversations with God. I can remember uh, leaving a home. I, 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 I bought a new home, and we, I was moving from the home that I had lived in. And you know what? I know this is going to sound weird, but I can remember hugging the house. <laughs> And I hug the house. I, I, I have this disease, Neil. I take a lot of photos and I can say thank you and thank you and thank you and thank you and thank you. Yeah. And I actually kissed the house and said thank you for the years that we spent together and the joy that you brought me. And may you continue to bring this joy 
to the next person that calls you home. I, I, I've, I've almost all my life I've treated things squirrels in the backyard, you know, the apple tree outside. Mm -hmm. I, I, I even treat my car that way. I think of my car as my pal. So I've always treated things as if we are all one. And I, I don't I don't feel separate. Individualized, yes. Separate, no. Thank you. And then the next question, completely on cue. I planned this, which I didn't. <laughs> the next question is, what do we need to know for Hannah's generation and for all the kids today? Yeah. I know. Yeah. That we need to know that we are as blessed as we appear to be and that our world can be as wonderful as we are now if we never lose our innocence and our wonderfulness as, as we grow older. We need to know that we do not have to grow out of the immaculate mm -hmm. essence that we now demonstrate. We need to know that it's not necessary to abandon ourselves and to set aside our highest thoughts and our biggest dreams and our grandest notion, including our grandest notion of who we are. That's what we need to know. And that the world is worth saving. What do we need to know, Neil, for animals today? And you mentioned the squirrel. All animals are part of the living system in which we coexist. And that we should treat all animals with love and dignity and caring and understanding, and also with respect for the choices that they make, including the choice that some animals make to be of service to us. Thank you. Uh, last question of this series, then we've got to find where people can go to get your books and all of your work. What action can our audience take to help humanity evolve? Help themselves evolve. See, I, 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 I gave up 30 years ago trying to change the world, or for that matter, trying to help the world evolve. I decided years ago to focus on helping myself evolve and then to share that process with everyone whose life I touch. And that by so doing, I understood that that is what would help others evolve. To show others what is possible within the human experience. To demonstrate what is possible within the human experience. That's all that the Buddha did. That's all that any of the masters, male or female, through the centuries have ever done. They just shown us to ourselves in the highest version. That's why we call them masters. So the opportunity for us is to change the world by changing the self. Thank you, Neil. You are a master. You are an idea hero. And I imagine if we each dust ourselves off and see who and what we truly are, we can all be a master as well. Well, I reject the notion that I'm a master. I'm not a master uh, at anything, but I I did um, manage to bring through what was given to me to share, and I, I will I will acknowledge myself for having done that. But I haven't reached a level of mastery or even come close to it in my life. But I'm on the way, and I now know what it is I'm seeking to do. Oh. Can I resist asking that? Let's put it this way. Where can people go to find out more? And what is it you're seeking to do? 
What I'm seeking to do is to demonstrate and express with every thought, word, and deed the grandest version of the greatest vision ever I held about who I am. I'm seeking to self-realize, or if to put it in one word, to evolve to the next level in the expression of myself, capital S. How people can get in touch with me should they choose to, if they want to stay connected with this message, is to just go to cwgconnect.com. CWG, of course, standing for Conversations with God. So cwgconnect.com will take them to a website where they'll find an opportunity to stay connected with me and with this message. And forgive me for asking if they're looking for a copy of the book and cannot afford one. If they wish to have a copy of the book, The God Solution, I will send them my author's manuscript right from my computer, the computer that I typed it out on. And I'll just I'll just upload it to them at no cost. Anybody who wants a copy of the God Solution, just send me an email and I will upload it to your computer at no cost. Because I want everyone to read it. And uh, people send it to Neil at NeilDonaldWalsh.com. And of course, I'm going to recommend you have the resources. Buy a copy for yourself. Buy a copy for a loved one. And buy a copy for someone who's struggling that you don't even know. Neil, this has been... Uh, there are no superlatives without words. Uh, but I guess as, as a host, I get to ask if there are any final words from you, from this pure brilliance, pure, pure love there. My last word would be, my dear friends, your life is not about you. It's about everyone whose life you touch and the way in which you touch it. <laughs> she, there's, there's a living demonstration of that right there. Thank you, Neil. This has been truly brilliant. I cannot thank you enough. So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler and Hannah Bear. <laughs> be well. Have fun. Oh, be pure love or as close as you can be and above and beyond all else. And that means discovering your greatness. Shine bright. Woohoo! How does it get any better than this, Neil? How does it get any better than this? <laughs> yeah. Wow, wow, wow. Another all-time favorite. It's one after the next, after the next. I, this is pure love. That conversation was pure love. Who you are is pure love as well. Oh, did you just kiss the mic? That was amazing. Which means you just sent love to everybody. Oh my God, that was incredible. <laughs> I think without words here, of course, you can join us for a school of mystics where we are all working on pure love. Oh my God, Q. And find the link for that down below that says four Wednesdays a month. Oh, how does it get any better than this? You can learn automatic writing and communicate with God as well. You can go uh, to automaticwriting.com. The link is down there below as well. And of course, if you want a daily dose of goodness from communicating with guides and angels in the universe itself, you can go to dailywoohoo.com as well. So here's a link. <laughs> you are amazing. I just, I just, you're sending so much love. I can't even stop this. This is just, oh. <laughs> I wonder if everybody can hear you kissing the mic. Okay, here's a link. <laughs> To the next amazing video. Love you guys so much. We need some food here. We need some milk. We've got a sandwich emergency and keep on shining bright. <laughs> How does it get any better than this?